We are back and we are joined now by Professor Francis Boyle, human rights lawyer who has previously argued and won in front of the International Court of Justice, professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law, and author of many books uh, on these topics as well. Professor, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thank you very much for having me on my best to your listening audience. Uh, of course. Um, well, I'm sure they appreciate that because we're, we're very happy to have you um, as we kind of flesh out this news that we've gotten um, over the past few days that South Africa is um, charging Israel with crimes of genocide uh, in front of the International Court of Justice. But let's start, I guess, from the beginning. The, uh, the International Court of Justice, sometimes, you know, colloquially called The Hague because of its location there in the Netherlands. What is the ICJ's function um, and procedures as somebody who has argued and won in front of the ICJ? Uh, yes, it's called the uh, World Court, the International Court of Justice. It was originally founded in uh, 1921. Uh, and I was the first lawyer ever to win anything from the World Court uh, on the basis of the Genocide Convention. Uh, I sued Yugoslavia for the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina and won two massive uh, orders of provisional measures of protection on behalf of the Bosnians against the Yugos to cease and desist from committing all acts of genocide against the Bosnians. This was the first time ever that uh, any lawyer had ever won two orders in the World Court since it was founded in 1921. In addition, I also uh, uh, convinced the prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, to indict Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic for almost every crime in the ICTY statute, in two, including two counts of genocide, one for uh, genocide against uh, Bosnia in general, and the second for the uh, genocide at Srebrenica. Uh, he was put on trial in The Hague after the close of the prosecution's case he filed a motion to dismiss all charges. In a decision, the uh, tribunal uh, dismissed his, uh, denied his motion, and ruled that there was enough uh, evidence to convict him on all charges, including the two counts of genocide, and that he should then proceed to uh, open his defense, whereupon he died, and that was that. So that's my uh, experience dealing with genocide. Uh, based on no, based on my no, yeah. review based on my review of the uh, documents filed by the Republic of South Africa, the application of request for provisional measures of protection, uh, protection, I predict that they will win an order of provisional measures of protection on behalf of the Palestinians uh, uh, against uh, Israel. And that order would probably come down one week after the close of hearings at the end of next week, at least based on the uh, time frame I did uh, for Bosnia. So the time frame was quite short in, uh, in, in your work uh, with Bosnia. That is correct. My uh, hearings were on April 1 and April 2. And I won this uh, massive overwhelming order for Bosnia on April 8th. So my guess is we're, we'd be talking about one week after the uh, the hearings close next Friday. Which makes sense given, you know, the urgency of crimes of genocide that the ICJ would structure the process in such a way. That is correct. They're supposed to... Uh, deal with this matter uh, urgently, as urgently as possible. So um, how does this uh, charge differ from the war crimes charges that are currently in front of the International Criminal Court? If you could give our audience a sense of the difference in those two bodies and why this is a uh, 
seemingly from my reading um a a process that's going to more likely yield uh some relief for the the palestinians who are undergoing um i mean unimaginable death and uh, horror at this moment yes um the international uh criminal court which is also located in the hague is rotten corrupt and despicable uh, after Operation Cast Lead in 2009, I advised the uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas to accept the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and uh, prosecute highest level officials of the Israeli government. That was 2009. Since then, 2009, the International Criminal Court has not lifted even one finger to help the Palestinians. Not one finger. And so for that reason, uh, all the death and destruction that has been inflicted uh, on the Palestinians um, are on the hands of the International Criminal Court. They have Palestinian blood on their hands, including the 30,000 dead Palestinians now. If they had acted after 2009 to start uh, indicting Israeli officials, I don't believe any of this would have happened. So for this reason, uh, uh, since the ICC has done nothing since 2009, uh, we launched a campaign uh, to take this matter to the uh, International Court of Justice that will act. What is the root of that corruption, as you describe? I mean, what what uh, is it is essentially the same kind of like Western bias that we see in the structure of uh, the, the United Nations and say the U.S. having veto power via the Security Council? Is it kind of something in that vein? Yes, the United States government puts uh, pressure on the ICC. And then in addition, its uh, primary funders there are European uh, NATO states. And of course, most of them uh, support the genocide that uh, uh, Israel has been inflicting on the Palestinians for quite some time. He who pays the piper calls the tune there at the ICC. Whereas at the uh, International Court of Justice, uh, its uh, expenses, salary, are paid out of the um, United Nations budget that is set by the General Assembly. Can, can you explain the historic significance of South Africa in particular bringing this case to the ICJ? Sure. The mere bringing uh, of this case, the filing, is a severe body blow against Israel to accuse it of genocide because the origins of the genocide convention came out of the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews. It's that simple. And, and, and would you also add that in the past, I mean, South Africa as an apartheid state was one of Israel's stronger allies uh, before, obviously, that that regime, you know, uh, the apartheid regime was was toppled. That's exactly uh, correct. The, Israel and the Zionists worked uh, hand in glove with the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. Um, and in terms of this case in particular, you uh, believe that in the, uh, a short period of time, um, a few weeks at this point, once this this process concludes, that you believe that South Africa's case um, that, that they they will win uh, in the ICJ, or at least you know a, a charge will be le uh, levied against Israel. Um, I believe that uh, based on what my reading, but I am not a lawyer, that Israel has been committing crimes of genocide against the Palestinian people. Um, but from your legal expertise as a human rights uh, lawyer, wh why do you think that this case um, has, has so much merit? 
Well, as the case in, in the Bosnians, once I won that order from the world court, it was undeniable to the entire world that genocide was going on against the Bosnians by the Yugos, and the uh, world had an obligation to prevent that genocide. I believe the uh, same thing will happen here. If you read the uh, application and request for provisional measures uh, by the uh, Republic of South Africa, <clears throat> it's outstanding. Obviously put together by a team of first-rate uh, international lawyers. Indeed, it's better than what I did because I did it all by myself. Mm. I didn't have a, uh, a team of lawyers. I did the best I could as, uh, as one man. So here you have uh, an entire team of first-rate international lawyers uh, uh, working for uh, South Africa, and they put together really uh, outstanding uh, application uh, and requests for provisional measures of protection. So if I could uh, win those orders, those two orders all by myself, uh, I'm confident the uh, South African team is going to win. I want to play for you a short audio clip from yesterday where White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby uh, was asked specifically about this case, Israel uh, being charged by South Africa with genocide in the International Court of Justice. Um, he responded dismissively, and I'm, uh, I'm going to play this for you, uh, Professor, and if you could give your thoughts afterwards. South Africa's filed this 84-page lawsuit against Israel, accusing them of genocide. Israel says that this is blood libel. Does Washington agree? And where does this put Washington and Pretoria? We find this uh, submission meritless, counterproductive, and uh, completely without any basis in fact whatsoever. So meritless, counterproductive, and completely without any basis in fact whatsoever. What is your assessment of that claim by John Kirby? Well, uh, Kirby is uh, a retired naval uh, admiral and a PR flack. He's not a lawyer. But the reason uh, he said this is because the Biden administration has aided and abetted Israeli genocide against the Palestinians. And it, if you read uh, Article uh, 3, Paragraph E, it criminalizes complicity in genocide. So right now, as of today, since certainly uh, October 8, the Biden administration has been complicit in Israeli genocide in violation of the Genocide Convention itself and also in violation of the United States government's own Genocide Convention Implementation Act. And in response to uh, that, my friends at the Center for Constitutional Rights and the uh, National Lawyers Guild have filed a lawsuit against uh, Biden, Blinken, and Austin uh, for violating not only the Genocide Convention, uh, but the U.S. own uh, Genocide Convention Implementation Act. It's a felony. So they're guilty here, too. And uh, complicity in genocide. And what are the charges of genocide that are defined by the United Nations and international law that Israel is specifically in violation of? Right. Uh, those can be found in uh, Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, first paragraph A, killing members of the group. Uh, right now, my guess is we have just short of uh, 30,000 murdered Palestinians. By comparison, in the uh, Bosnia case, uh, the International Court of Justice in the final judgment on the merits in 2007 ruled that even the uh, 7,000 murdered Bosnian Muslims at Srebrenica were genocide. So we're talking now of a multiple of three to four uh, uh, of what the World Court already found was genocide. Uh, second, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Well, 
you know, we have uh, latest reports, maybe uh, 40,000 Palestinians uh, wounded. Uh, uh, that's uh, bodily harm, metal harm. Well, just turn on any television station and uh, listen to the pleas of the Palestinians. Third, Article 2, Paragraph C of the Genocide Convention says, quote, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, unquote. Well, of course, we have the uh, minister over there saying there'll be no food, no water, no fuel, no medical supplies, uh, et cetera. And another uh, official saying they were going to uh, reduce uh, Israel to Auschwitz, uh, sorry, Gaza to Auschwitz. So that gives you a pretty good idea of their genocidal uh, intent. We all know what happened at Auschwitz. And then uh, finally, imposing measures intended to prevent births uh, within the group, paragraph uh, D. Well, we already know there's there's a minimum of 40,000, uh, sorry, 4,000 dead Palestinian uh, children. Uh, there are thousands of uh, uh, Palestinian women who need to deliver uh, babies, but all the hospitals uh, have been uh, destroyed. Ambulances uh, are attacked, uh, and they are just unable to get uh, any type of uh, medical uh, attention for the births of those babies. So you could read the uh, South African uh, application. It's on the World Court website, and they have all the documentation in there uh, since December 29. Uh, after December 29, it, it's gotten worse and progressively uh, deteriorated. Uh, I suspect they will be uh, updating uh, these atrocities uh, uh, up to the start of the uh, hearing. That's what I did for the Bosnians. So in other words, the uh, the, the charge that this this case is without merit and evidence is essentially bunk um, because the, it seems to me, based on my based on what you're saying and my cursory uh, reading of this case, that there's quite a bit of footnotes and evidence presented. That is correct. As I said, uh, I won two of these orders all on my own uh, without any assistance except uh, uh, some research by law students. Uh, whereas here, uh, by example uh, and comparison, you have an entire team of first-rate international law professors who have put this together uh, with the uh, assistance of a government. Uh, the uh, legal team is headed by a friend of mine, Professor uh, John Dugard uh, from South Africa. He's one of the top international law professors uh, in the world. Not only that, but um, Professor Dugard was one of the few white professors who stood up worldwide uh, against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa at risk to his life. And then later on, uh, Professor Dugard became UN Special Rapporteur for uh, Palestine. I read all of his uh, reports. They are uh, excellent. So his... Uh, heart and his mind, uh, uh, soul, uh, are, are in this. And uh, uh, Israel, in my opinion, doesn't have uh, anyone on their side who could hold a candle to him based on his knowledge, judgment, and experience dealing with the Palestinian issue. And before that, the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. Indeed, when Professor Dugard was a special rapporteur for Palestine, uh, he wrote an article saying that the system of apartheid that Israel uh, has applied to the Palestinians is worse than what the uh, Afrikaners had applied to the black people in apartheid South Africa. Um, so you're saying that the potential legal representative, Alan Dershowitz, does not hold a candle to uh, the South African legal team. I'm sure you've heard those rumors at that point that that Israel wants Dershowitz to represent them. My uh, my my uh, response to that would be, go ahead. I would love to see that. You're certainly correct. I mean, uh, uh, Dershowitz goes back to when I uh, 
uh, entered Harvard Law School in September 1971. Uh, Dershowitz knows nothing about international law and human rights. He's just uh, a, a showboater. Uh, indeed, I debated Dershowitz uh, over the uh, BDS matter and clobbered him. And during the course of the uh, debate, Dershowitz admitted that I was the expert on international law and human rights. Indeed, uh, he at the uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, War Crimes uh, Tribunal, uh, I was there to prosecute uh, Israel uh, for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. Dershowitz chickened out. At Harvard Law School, we used to say that the most dangerous person in the world, a uh, place in the world, is standing between uh, Dershowitz and a TV camera crew. <laughs> so I think that's great. Uh, let them let uh, Israel sign up Dershowitz. Uh, they will be committing their own goal right there, sure, uh, to borrow a, a hockey or a, a soccer term. Absolutely. Um, lastly, before uh, we let you go, um, that we have a viewer question that says uh, overpaid engineer writes in, what happens if Israel ignores any ICJ orders? Well, South Africa will take it to the uh, Security Council for Enforcement. If the Americans veto uh, Security Council, Council Enforcement, which they will probably do uh, based on you know their veto in the Nicaragua case, South Africa can then take it to the UN General Assembly under the uh, Uniting for Peace resolution and have the UN General Assembly adopt severe sanctions against Israel, which would include, for example, suspending Israel from participation in the activities of the UN General Assembly, exactly what they did to the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa, and exactly what they did to the uh, genocidal Yugoslavia, my <laughs> opponent. Uh, second, the General Assembly can admit Palestine as a UN member state. Right now, Palestine is a uh, UN observer state, just like Switzerland was uh, before it became a full-fledged UN member state. Historically, uh, no UN member state has been destroyed, uh, and uh, it's obvious that the Netanyahu government, all its ministers, want to destroy uh, Palestine and the Palestinians. Third, the UN General Assembly could set up an international criminal tribunal for Israel under uh, Article 22 of the UN uh, Charter. I made a day march to that effect, uh, and uh, uh, Iran, Malaysia, and many Arab Muslim states uh, supported it in the General Assembly, but that initiative was sabotaged by the usual uh, suspects. But I would hope the uh, General Assembly, under these circumstances, and with an order, uh, will return to International Criminal Tribunal uh, for Israel. And then finally, the General Assembly could recommend UN member states adopting comprehensive uh, economic sanctions against Israel under the Uniting for Peace resolution. Right now, today, North Korea is subjected to an extremely harsh uh, regime of economic uh, sanctions against it that were imposed by the UN General Assembly uh, under the uh, Uniting for Peace resolution. So the same thing could be done to Israel. Well, uh, can't thank you enough for your time and working through uh, the technical difficulties with us. Uh, Professor Francis Boyle, human rights lawyer, um, who's one in front of the International Court of Justice, professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law. Uh, and you can look up his many books as well. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks so much uh, for having me on and uh, at least to uh, explain to your audience uh, what you know what's going to happen here. I really uh, I appreciate it and I do hope that the uh, the world holds Israel to account. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye bye.